close the door with this little deal. So now we can. You should be able to hear us inside with that. That's right. They yeah. should. They pick up our mics yeah. in the room. Good afternoon. Um, it's June 21st, Tuesday, 4 p.m., and this is the Ordinance Committee meeting. Uh, I'd like to call it to order. Um, and we have present here Councillor Rowan, Councillor St. Clair, myself, uh, the uh, town manager, Tom Hall, should be back shortly, and Tracy is here to take notes. Um, do we have approval of, we have minutes from September 19th and January 19th that have not been uh, discussed yet? Uh, so moved. Do we have a second? Uh, uh, second uh, request that we take them independently, though. I can't vote on the September. That, oh, that's correct. Um, Thank you, Tom. Do you want to make a motion that we divide them? Uh, please. Yes, please. <laughs> I would like to make a, um, a motion on item number three, the approval of the minutes of September 19th, 2015, and January 19th, 2016, to separate them, please. Okay. Seconded. Okay, so moved. All in favor, we should say. Okay. So moved. Um, approval of September 19th, 2015. That'd be two of us and one Push. abstention because he wasn't here. And I wasn't here in January. Okay, so on January oh. <laughs> 19th, approval. That's proved by two with one abstention. I guess I was the only one here for both of them. Yeah. All right, we have before <laughs> us today, <laughs> yeah, we have before us today a proposed blasting ordinance for the town of Scarborough that's brought to our attention by a, a citizen who uh, had some concerns uh, with construction on Route 1 where they did uh, some blasting for uh, foundation work, which um, I was totally surprised to find out we didn't have an ordinance that addressed this specifically. Um, and sh uh, Ms. Hill suggested that we um, look at it and come up with something. And when I talked to the town manager, uh, Manager Hall, he did tell me that the fire department had been working on it. And Mr. Hall, if you wouldn't mind just sure. letting me know a little bit about the background, that'd be great. Yeah, um, historically the town of Scarborough has not had a local ordinance that governs blasting activity. We've relied on the state fire marshal's office and state statute, which is fairly robust in its own right. But it's not uncommon. In fact, uh, right. through our research, there are a number of local ordinances that uh, perhaps provide a little finer detail and maybe some more stringent requirements in terms of notice and the like uh, beyond what state law requires. And so uh, I, I did ask Chief Thurlow to do some uh, research and come up with a proposal, which is what's before you this evening. Uh, in fact, I probably sent out an earlier draft. What was in the packet for this meeting, though, did incorporate some further input from the industry. Uh, he did have some time between, you know, in preparation for the meeting to get some industry input, input as well. So. Uh, the chief is here. Um, if you would like to have a pres presentation from him, and I think we have some members of the audience as well that okay. might want to speak. Yeah, uh, Chief Thurlow, would you mind uh, talking to us a bit about this? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, the uh, <coughs> fire department did actually start a draft doing it some time ago, and it's just one of those things that we never got to the point of actually bringing it to you. Um, the reason we did that is because, as Tom mentioned, that there are a number of regulations that are currently enforced at the state level, but one of the things that is difficult is enforcement of those. Um, for us, it's quite an onerous process because it's state law. So this does uh, give us some local enforcement authority. Uh, the original draft that went out was um, based on some research that we had done in a number of different communities, and um, we weren't looking to be overly um, restrictive or to put a lot of language in the ordinance that is already covered in the standards 
um, that these folks have to follow anyway. We kept it uh, relatively generic so that it was more to clarify the notification piece and to make sure that we had some um, penalties and violation and enforcement language in there. From the original draft, we wanted to make sure we had some citizen feedback, but we also wanted to make sure that we reached out to the contractors that do work in town to get some feedback from them. So not only have we made some adjustments based on um, Ms. Hill's comments, but also two or three comments that we got back from the industry, and that was the second round of revisions that came out. Um, and I am happy to go through the detail of that if you'd like. Yeah, if you would, that'd be great. Incidentally, okay. this version is the redline version, so yeah, you can okay. actually see that those uh, additional changes that. Uh, mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Did you get the red line? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So the first change from the original draft language that we are proposing is in section five under notifications. And the language as written talked about actually performing pre-blast surveys. And one of the industry folks said there's a lot of times when we're getting folks that don't want the survey. And the way that the original language was in there, if everybody didn't do it, then technically they hadn't completed that Ouch. Benchmark. Okay. So the proposed language is that uh, a letter certifying that the pre-blast surveys were offered to be conducted um, on each structure on a property located within 500 feet. That on a property was dealing with what Ms. Hill was, her com issue was that her property fell within the 500 foot circumference from the blast zone but her house did not. So even oh. though she owned property within the zone, the house fell outside of the envelope. This clarifies that point. So any parcel, any property or building within a parcel that is within oh, okay. the circumference is now covered. Okay. So if, if I could just clarify, so, so therefore her, she would need to be offered the, um, the, the survey. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that's good because that was one of my concerns when I read the original yep. draft. That was okay. just some clarifying okay. language. And, and I, I certainly understand uh, this, comment actually came from L.P. Murray, I believe it was, and, and Cape Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and that I thought was a, a valid point in terms of the fact that a number of folks just don't care to have people in there doing the survey, and there's mm -hmm. nothing they can do about it as long as they make the offer. Right. The next change was under the hours of detonation um, originally, and, and there was really no science behind it. Uh, we copied the, the four blasts per day limit from somebody else's ordinance and uh, we were told by, I think, two different contractors that that may not be realistic, that they will often do four or more in a morning mm. or afternoon. So we just changed that to 10. Um, once again, there's no real science behind it. I think that's just mm. a matter of trying to make sure they've got a productive day and um, it's a policy decision for you folks. Under other requirements, one of the things that Ms. Hill had mentioned was um, some seismography data. Um, and we did spend some time researching this as well. The standards require them to, to have this. I know Ms. Hill has, has advocated that a third party do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that that uh, in our research is necessary. Um, I think the, the blasters by their insurance carriers need to keep this data to, to protect themselves. The recording devices do keep a record of it. We didn't go to the point of requiring those reports uh, afterwards, but have included language so that those reports are available should we get a complaint and want to research what was done or follow up on, on a citizen's complaint, that we have the ability to do that. So that's mm -hmm. what we're proposing in terms of the additional language there that wasn't in the first draft. Okay. Any other questions that I can address? Or I've got Jim, yeah, Jim Butler um, is a I, fire inspector and did a lot of the work on this. I do have questions, but I'm going to defer to the chair because I think she has um, uh, an agenda that she wants to kind of follow through. And then, do you mind, Madam Chair, if I ask no, after? No, that's fine. Yeah. If we don't get the answers that we need. Yeah. Did you have anything? Yeah, can I just uh, the the clarification? The the what is the survey that is being conducted? Or that it's offered to be. What are the specifics of the survey? I'm just curious. I'm, I'm not just not familiar with the. If you, you roughly. Asking? 
they, they assess the, the, the structural integrity of the and structure take photographs before and, after. and Yeah, it's to make sure that after they do it, there's no cracks in the walls that weren't there. Gotcha. And can see before or after. Madam Chair, it, it may make yeah. sense for those at home uh, if Chief or, or Mr. Butler just give a quick overview of how this program is to work. Uh, we kind of jumped sure. right to the revisions as opposed to a simple description of what what this ordinance entails and kind of the big picture. Thank if, you. If you don't mind. No. Nope. So essentially when any company is going to come in and blast for a cell hole or any type of construction project, they need to get a local permit. That's the, the basis of the the ordinance. So there's some requirements in terms of what they need to supply, including the copies of their liability insurance and, and, and a, an application process that also speaks to the properties that are located within this 500 foot zone where they are required by the, or the codes to do these pre-blast pre surveys. And we picked that 500 foot because it's already an existing standard and we felt that that was a good place to at least start this discussion in terms of who should be notified as direct abutters to a blasting area. And then there's also a notification process. So in, in addition to the pre-blast surveys for those that are in there, we're also asking them to make sure that they notify everybody of when the blast will occur so that, you know, children that are sleeping or having a nap aren't woken up. Yeah. It also requires them to notify our dispatch center so that we know when there's a blast mm -hmm. going on. Uh, and that we're not sending <coughs> false alarm fire calls to something that, you know, there's an explosion in the neighborhood. Well, we know it's a controlled explosion and it's permitted to be done so. Mm -hmm. uh, we restricted the hours of detonation. Once again, that, that came from another uh, standard from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, and we did not allow <coughs> blasting on Sundays as the original draft language in here. And then there are some uh, penalties and en enforcement actions. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you were looking for, Tom? Yeah, the one, uh, it's really a question. I, it alludes to a fee, but it's not. Mm. The fee uh, is part of the fee schedule. It's right. a $50 permit okay. just to cover the cost of processing. That's in the, the budget schedule <coughs> with all our other fees. I, I did have a few more questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the, when you, when you sp said that the, um, the, the homeowners would have to know when it was going to happen, what, are they providing times? Are they providing an, an hour window? Are they providing how, how specifically? How specific do they have to be when they're saying the times? The, oh, sorry. The dates and time. There, we didn't go into the the specific language. It just essentially says time. on this date between these hours, we will be conducting blasting at this location. Okay. And then uh, there are more specific notifications with horn blast. Uh, yeah, much so much closer of their to the detonation before they blast. There's a horn. They have to sound a horn mm. to make sure. Right. Yep. Uh, any other questions? Uh, my, my next question was the, the uh, section five, uh, number one, um, suggests that property owners must be made notification of, to other property owners must be made no more than four days in advance. I thought that w that wording was strange. <laughs> wouldn't it wouldn't it be the other way, less than, so that they have more time to plan or? Um, well, and once again, that's kind of arbitrary. We stuck that in there such that they wouldn't be told two weeks beforehand when they were doing the pre survey and then forget about it, and then all right. of a sudden uh, these right. things start that's happening. Good. So we tried to keep that notification relatively close, but also recognize that a lot of times the, these contractors are hiring a third party to go out and right. do those surveys. So this may happen several weeks in advance of the actual detonation, and that's kind of why we, we stuck that language in there. Technically, they're getting multiple notices. They are, because the, they're in the same 500-foot envelope, <laughs> so they should be knowing about it during the survey right. time, and then, again, with, within four days, they should be getting another notice. I'm wondering if we should That's have right. a, a bracketed thing in there that says, must be made no more than four days nor less than whatever, just to make sure that they're giving people enough notice, too. So yeah. That's just my... I, I would agree. Uh, yeah. Suggestion. Yeah. We can make that change. Uh, when Will's done, let me know. I'm, yeah. I'm finished. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, is it, are you okay with um, hearing from the audience members first? Uh, yeah. They might answer I'm my questions. In. Oh, okay. But if you wanted to go yeah, to that. Yeah, I'd rather yeah. wait. And then okay. as long as you're okay with yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, do we have any audience members who would like to? 
Yeah. Come up and yeah. If you'd uh, tell us who you are and the. Yep. Uh, my name is uh, Will Farrington. Um, the division manager uh, overseeing our operations in the state of Maine for Maine drilling and blasting. Okay. Um, I'm also third generation in this business. My grandfather started the business mm -hmm. and sixth generation of my family in the industry. So uh, quite a bit of drilling and blasting knowledge has lied in my, uh, with the family and been passed on to me over the years. <laughs> uh, I apologize. I got an opportunity to look at the ordinance but not provide feedback before now. Um, I just had some comments on sections that I identified. I mm -hmm. do a lot of um, travel going around the towns and evaluating the ordinances and, and sitting down at open panels and discussing it with them, pros and cons, and kind of uh, explaining what we see elsewhere. I mean, our company goes all the way down sure. to the Carolinas, so we have a pretty broad spectrum of uh, uh, experience there. And um, there was a lot of great points brought up in here. If you go under, um, my first comment was under Section 4, mm -hmm. the permit application, under B. Uh, it says, prior to applying for a Scarborough Fire Department blasting permit, the applicant's vehicle must have been inspected and hold a valid state of Maine uh, explosive transportation permit issued by the fire marshal's office. There's a couple different issues with that. Generally, the individual applying for the permit is not the individual who will be hauling the powder. And the, the actual label um, from the state fire marshal needs to be attached to the magazine at all times. So that vehicle that ends up transporting the product to the site that day um, generally won't be available to come directly to the fire department to be inspected or show proof of that uh, label. Secondary to that, uh, it's not out of practice for a blasting contractor to buy product from a retail manufacturer and have the retail manufacturer de deliver directly to the site. Hmm. Therefore, it wouldn't be the um, explosive or blasting contractors um, permit to transport that would be being used, it would be the retail suppliers, so it would not be applicable in that uh, case. Um, just that's kind of difficult to, you know, provide if, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so how would we, I'm just curious in your opinion with your experience, how would we, um, you know, protect ourselves when that person is coming to apply for that permit? Because in my opinion, that's in there to protect the town of Scarborough so that they can make sure that everything is on the up, biddy up. Does yeah, that I mean, make sense? ATF and DOT are all over this. They have roadside inspections on a regular basis and stops. Um, so do you think that's like a null point that that doesn't even need to be in there? I've never seen that language in any other permit I've applied for. Okay. Um, so uh, to me, that was just a little bit odd. Um, and it, it's very hard to uh, to live up to, especially, uh, for example, in the state of Maine, we have 10 blasters that haul product on a daily basis. And um, the way we're set up is if we don't have work for them in the state of Maine, we find work for them elsewhere. So they may not even be uh, in a reasonable radius to get them here prior to the day of blasting. You wouldn't even have some. You wouldn't even have someone to come that has that label to apply for that permit. Correct. Generally, it's myself or other supervisors that apply for all the permits. Would it, would it be appropriate to provide proof to suggest that, that either, either to require that it be delivered by such a vehicle or that we could somehow prove during the application process that a vehicle was it is. intended to be? I think he said that it is. They're there. The trucks are there once they're at the blasting site. It's that they're going to apply, and please jump in and correct me if sure, I'm wrong. Yeah. They're probably, in my opinion, with my experience, they're applying for these permits weeks, months before the job even happens. It so says right at the beginning that it's five days prior to, right. to any um, blasting. So they're not even, you know what I mean? So the trucks that have those stickers on them are at the blasting but site. Presumably you would either have like some kind of, you know, delivery arrangement made from the from the retail provider or like some kind of documentation that you, in fact, the company owned such vehicles. You know what I mean? Either or you're having someone. Well, I don't so think I think we have to be really careful and not get too, you know, with these ordinances, we have to be very careful not to get too nitpicky. I totally understand and agree with what you're saying, and I'm always a proponent of making sure that the town is fully covered. I just I always get a little bit nervous when we make our ordinances so stringent that it's makes it hard for people to do business here. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It sounds mm -hmm. like for practical reasons, making it part of the permit application, it might be difficult. Um, but I think it, I'm sure you would agree, this is governed by state and more importantly federal law. I think it's important to have a statement that any vehicle transporting explosive materials mm -hmm. must have the proper credential. Mm -hmm. yep. And if they don't, yeah. there's under penalty of law, not only this, but others, I presume. Correct. Chief, did you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry about that. No, no, that's a great question. I think what might be hanging uh, well up is the thing about must have been inspected. Are you reading that as we're going to inspect that? Correct. Product? That wasn't the intent. Oh, okay. I think the language that's in there, and, and we could probably strike the inspected. When Jim uh, crafted this language, it was talking about the state fire marshals permitting these vehicles in advance. So mm -hmm. that the vehicles are permitted at the state level. Right. And that they are inspecting them as part of that permitting process, not that we're expecting them to bring the, the vehicle to us to inspect Oh, well, that's how I read it. Yeah. Okay. So that, that I read it the way the way I don't you, think we have any well. problem in terms, if you wanted to, to say must have been inspected, I think what we were looking for is that state fire marshal certification. Yeah, and I, I don't want to get hung up on uh, semantics here either, but if the vehicle in question transporting the, the product is, uh, and don't hold me verbatim because I'm going to struggle to remember it, uh, I believe if its original departure is outside of the state of Maine and it's only coming into the state of Maine to do business and then leave that same day, it doesn't have to be inspected by the Maine State Fire Marshal. So say the product was coming out of New Hampshire, coming yeah. into Maine for the just the day and then going back to New Hampshire, that's where it falls under the federal and that's where some of these things get a little squirrely because it's federal. Correct. Uh, when you look at the, the federal modal carrier transportation rules, yes, it is covered in that. I'm with you. But it just... Correct. Correct. I'm sorry, it, so this is in section two, it's, we're kind of covered by... You would say that this... <laughs> yeah, so I'm Jim Butler, fire inspector. I don't think we've met. Yes. How are yes. you? So uh, section two, uh, B and C, uh, Title 49 and Title 27 will cover exactly what he's talking about. Okay. So if a vehicle comes from out of state, they're here for the day, like you said, um, they're not going to need that license, um, and it exempts that in B and C. So I think we can clarify a little better in, in Section 4, uh, Section B, and maybe put something unless exempted by those two. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be my yeah. recommendation is that... Um, can you read it, Jamie? marie like how you... Can you... Are you? Could you just read it to me, like how you think it would be? No, no oh, I can't. No, yeah, I, yeah, I would want to see. What I was going to say is, I would want to see this um, rewarding. Yeah. Have some rewarding on yeah. this. But that's something. So we'll make a notation of that. Mm -hmm. Come back to that. I agree. Okay. Any? Uh, I'm sorry. Did you have another question? I did not before? have another question. Okay. But I, the uh, the next one still under section four, um, under C, um, two I. A scaled map denoting the speci uh, specific blasting locations and identifying all structures located within 500 feet of the blast area. Uh. I don't see um, an issue identifying all structures located within 500 feet. Um, the blast area and um, specific blasting locations on a scaled map is going to be very difficult. Generally on small cellar holes, swimming pools, or small scale residential projects, the rock's not fully stripped contractor will hit ledge, stop immediately so they don't incur undue necessary costs, and they'll call a contractor and get a price. At that point, um, the full scope of the drilling and blasting is not generally understood. Oh, so to give a scaled map um, denoting the specific blasting locations is going to be tremendously difficult. Um, um, can you explain to me what a scaled map is? I'm sorry. So a, scale, <laughs> a scaled map would just be showing um, and this is my interpretation, and correct me if I'm um, misreading this, but it would be showing the different blast areas on the site to scale and their approximate yeah. distance to uh, nearby existing structures. Is that correct? Okay. Yep. okay. So um, could I just get a clarification? Your, your concern with this is, is the language of denoting the specific blasting location. It's not the identification of the structure. Yeah, 500 if they said area. general blasting location, um, you know, and identifying all structures located within 500 feet, that's that's probably a more feasible. You know, looking at it from a contractor's standpoint, the more specific the language, 
um, you know, as yeah. we're somebody who likes to follow the rules, the more right. you know, the more fearful we are of getting encroached upon for violating the rules. And you know, to me, I'm I'm going to tell the contractor you got to fully strip this. Unfortunately, um, you know, there's varying degrees of, of contractors anywhere in, in the world, right. and somebody else might just say good enough, close enough. And at that point, I'm disadvantaged as a contractor because I said I'm going to follow the letter to the T. So presumably uh, increasing the expense of the homeowner. But correct. So just on to follow up on the example of a, a swimming pool. So so say this general this as opposed to specific. Are we talking 20 feet different? When you're talking on a on a potential, you know, six, eight, ten acre site, because mm. you have to understand it could be a swimming pool or it could be a new res, uh, new commercial building going in some of the um, development areas. Uh, just because they hit rock at one end doesn't mean they're going to continue to strip the whole project. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to submit a permit and you've only shown rock at one end, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you you got a thousand feet now that there's potential for rock mm -hmm. in. D but don't you do uh, drilling to indicate to, to ascertain where ledge is and where isn't? Uh, generally, if the rock wasn't anticipated on the site to begin with, uh, there would be no um, preconditioned survey done. To estimate where the rock is, there's not always geotech mm -hmm. down on every project. Uh, I know that when they put my my parents' pool in my in in ground pool, they did they started it, and we actually ended up having to put it on the other side of their of our house when we were growing up because they hit ledge, yeah. and it was literally from like one side of the house to mm -hmm. the exact opposite side of the house. The geotech's 100 percent you know discretionary upon the owner. And a lot of owners these days are saying they'd rather take the risk than do any type of geotech, even on commercial is, projects. But the difference in what you describe is they avoided the ledge altogether. Right. No blasting occurred. Right. No, no, they started, well, you're right, they didn't blast. They started digging. Right, and said, oh, yep. let's find a yep. tougher, softer place on the side. On the and that works if you have a big enough envelope. Right, and we did. And we're talking 10 acres, so. Yep. But in your example of the commercial area, I would think you guys would have a general idea when you, when you show up to do the blasting of where... And generally, it, it will occur because I mean, at some point, you d I would assume you do one blast and you don't just hang out to find. You know. No, generally, we'll, at that point, what we would offer is um, a price to come in and probe so that they could get a, a mm. tighter grip on their scope, um, and that's either accepted or denied. Um, understand, there's you know, thousands of different ways that we price this work on a regular basis. Uh, unit price of uh, square foot or cubic yard or running foot. Uh, or simple day rate are very normal units of, of pricing. So if somebody doesn't want to take the, co the time to uncover all the rock, we could come in at a, on a daily rate, which we're just hanging around waiting for them to expose it. That way we're not, you know, upside down on our cost. Gotcha. But it, so it's also at no risk to us to stand you, there. So you, you blast the ledge, then they, they dig some more, and they determine whether there's another Correct. rock there. So you don't know. Nothing's really done in advance as far as you could be there for... We could be there for two months. We could be there for two hours. Correct. Okay. okay. Um, madam. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I think really what we're talking about here is just basically one word. So you're suggesting that instead of it saying specific blasting location, you're saying that we change that to general. General. And I think you were shaking your head saying that, that you thought that was feasible. I don't want to speak for you, but I saw you kind of <laughs> nodding. <laughs> so I just, I think we could probably change this really rather quickly as long as the fire department is comfortable with it. And obviously, I'm not speaking for anyone else on, on this panel. Uh, but I mean, I don't want to sit here and talk about a one line, one sentence for 30 yeah. minutes over one word. Sure. Uh, uh, and also, if you could address the scaled map. Sure, I, I think you did a great job of explaining the scaled map. No, but whether you think it should be in here or not. Well, I think the map. scaled map um, is a good thing to have in there, just showing that these are where the structures are, and this is the 500-foot okay. circumference, and they can get that right off our town GIS. If they yeah. choose our Google Maps and just make sure it's at a scaled level. Um, regarding, you know, everything he was talking about with the geotech, um, you know, recently some blasting down at Piper Shores, yeah. they did some probing and they didn't anticipate all the ledge they'd find down there. So, like he said, keep digging, keep yeah. blasting, keep digging until they're at a point where they can do what they need to do with foundations. So, I mean, personally, I think he makes up a good point, um, and I, I think by changing that one word from specific blasting location to general blasting location, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have any objections. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, the next area under Section 5, uh, notification. I just had a comment. Um, my comments, number of blasts, dates, and times are often difficult factors to predict. 
Um, so this may be a tough, uh, this may be not only tough to produce those exact times, but tough to enforce. Um, like I said, generally uh, on smaller type work or even some larger type work when the, the owner doesn't want to make the investment, uh, understanding the specific volumes and scope and scale of the project are difficult. Uh, not only that, but uh, you have equipment breakdowns and um, when you're setting multiple seismographs up, if you have uh, close proximity, the timing for your blast is, is very difficult to um, produce. Generally, our internal practice when we offer pre-blast surveys is we offer people the opportunity to get on a one hour, 24 hour uh, call list. So we're calling them to either give them one hour notification prior to blasting or 24 hour notification prior to blasting. Mm -hmm. um, that's our standard notification practice. If the town is different, we generally go with that. Um, but to give you know specific estimated number of blasts and times is, is generally uh, you know, a very difficult task to it's like trying to predict the winning lottery numbers um, so if, if I may the um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Gen understanding the intent mm -hmm. generally how have you seen other other ordinances address that particular you know the desire obviously is to give they ask for either specificity they either ask for a, a 24 hour notification to to any butters or a one hour or a lot of towns deal with it just by saying can we get a one hour or a four hour call to the fire and police department mm -hmm. And then our experience, our experience based on, you know, what gets built once the project gets started, if it's a long duration project, um, you know, generally the fire department, town office, police department will tell us at the beginning of the day, just call us, let us know you're going to be blasting today and approximately how many blasts you think. And then don't bother giving us one hour and four hour notices because if you're doing micro blasting, which is, very small number of holes, you know, one to two holes at a time. You could be shooting, you know, 50, 60 times in a day. And at that point, to be given one hour notice, you're not going to get that many opportunities to shoot that day, right. um, which is driving the cost up to the owners and the landowners in the town. Um, so generally at that point, they just say, uh, if you can tell us approximately how many times you think you're going to blast for the day, we're, mm -hmm. we're good enough. Can I ask a question about microblasting? Yes. What's the concussive effect of microblasting as opposed to so what I think of as blasting? Microblasting is very small charges, right. very small holes, and it's um, <laughs> it's more of a nuisance than you know vibration or anything. It's, I can equate it to a mechanical hole ramp. Yeah. You know, the, the large hammer you see on an excavator that downsizes the rock. It's, it's just one quick. I mean, not getting too far into the science blasting. You know, a, a blast happens in milliseconds. Right. So if you're only shooting one hole, you know, generally you have, say, 20, 9 to 25 milliseconds that yeah. they occur in that one blast. Um, and usually microblasting is taking place because you're right up against an existing structure in a very vibration sensitive area, um, and it's done to reduce vibration. Okay, so there's less concussive effect, so to speak, or, the vibra or what you call the vibration. Or Correct. The, okay. Um. <coughs> Are you sure? You like that? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'll be honest. This was probably when I read through this. This was the hours of detonation was probably the one thing that I was actually going to be more stringent on. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually uncomfortable with um, the entire thing. I felt like 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. was was way too long. I felt like it shouldn't be on Saturdays or Sundays, um, and I thought 10 times a day was um, too much. And I'm just speaking as um, you know, a homeowner and a landowner in town. Um, I just uh, blasting is loud. It's obnoxious. It's annoying. Um, when you have small children, it can be extremely disruptive. But I understand why it has to happen. So when I went through this whole thing, that was the that was probably the one thing that like red flagged me was this could be an issue. Um, I don't understand why there has to be blasting on a Saturday. I just don't. I, I'm just I. I just my personal opinion. It doesn't have anything to do with any of the other council members. Um, and I also thought that 7 a.m. in the morning um, was really early. I understand that most contractors and most um, laborers start very early in the morning, but blasting at 7 a.m. in the morning just seemed excessive to me. So generally, and, and I don't want to speak for the fire department, but generally blasting is allowed at the same time equipment operation is. Mm -hmm. so if, 
the town's ordinances, no quiet hours and, and equipment yeah, can start at 7 a.m.? It is. The reason blasting would coincide in that schedule. Understand if blasting is not allowed or the number of blasts in a day are reduced, now you're faced with HORAM. And HORAM is much louder mm -hmm. and much more obnoxious because it's constant. Oh, wow. So blasting takes place and you have milliseconds of disruption. Yeah. And then it's back to a break before the next blast. Right. Where HORAMing, yeah. they're going to sit in right. and just pound on a piece of rock. Right. That's what's happening now. So if you, if you understand magnitudes of scale, um, drilling and blasting, you can move you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of yards at once right. and only have, you know, at most three or 400 milliseconds of disturbance. Mm -hmm. A good day hoe ramming is about 30 yards moved. Okay. So if you have 300 yards of rock to remove and you can do it in one day blasting at four disturbances, it's going to take you 10 days of ah. eight to 10 hours a day of constant hoe ramming for the same volume to get moved. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Portland, and it's, uh, you know, no cheap shots at Portland. I just had to submit a 92-page blast plan and permit to get a uh, permit to blast at 802 Ocean Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are much more in favor of whole ram. And I think if you ask residents near any of their rock removal projects in Portland, all of a sudden blasting doesn't seem so bad. Right. <laughs> so I guess um, I, I, I'm still stuck on just, I would ask my fellow council members to um, consider not blasting on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, I can I'll be I can pull back on the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, I still think 10 times a day is excessive, but if that's what I'm not an expert. Uh, yeah, the chair just has to recognize you. Um, yeah, um, I'm not an expert. Um, you know, if, if the poli if the fire department thinks that that's what it takes, um, then I I probably would be I probably would be willing to back off on that, although I know that this isn't going to go anywhere today. We still have more work to do on this. Is that correct, Madam Chair? Are we not going to try to push this? No. Okay. So I, I want to think and get a little bit more feedback on the 10 times a day, but I, I do feel strongly about the Saturday and Sunday issue. I, I don't know. I just feel like those are family days, and um, Saturdays are days that, you know, we, this is Maine. We don't have, and, and it also probably flips, you could flip what I'm saying to your side, we don't have a lot of beautiful days in uh, in Maine, and Saturday is a day where a lot of families are outside and they're having parties, graduation parties, and things like that. And so I I lean more towards um, you know the comfort of our residents, and I just I don't know why I just have a hang up on the Saturday and Sunday thing. But if it's not if I'm not supported, that's totally understandable. Um, but I think out of that whole um, section, the only thing I just wouldn't agree with. And that I'm still stuck on is, this, is the Saturday Sunday thing. Mm -hmm. If I could just offer a thought on the number of uh, <coughs> times per day, the ten times per day, mm -hmm. yes. that that quite likely is a cost to, to business. They have mm -hmm. to remobilize, and right. you're also extending the period. I mean, would mm -hmm. it be nice to get it all done at once, right. as right. opposed to During stretching it over a longer time? So I think there's good point. There's some yeah, ten days benefit to that. Ten days still could be very restrictive. If or you ten blasts. Ten, ten blasts a ten day. Blasts, ten blasts in a day could be so very that's still restricted. restricted. Well, I was going to ask about that when it comes to microblasting. Right. Because a microblast, each microblast time, we'll get the fire department, I assume that's considered a blast? Each detonation would be considered a blast. So even the microblast? If you're shooting one hole at a time, you could shoot ten holes in a day and that's it. Okay. So okay, I... I <laughs> all right. So I'll black off on that <laughs> ten, on the ten times, but I'm still... I'm still going to, I would ask that my um, fellow counselors consider yeah, well, the Saturday to Sunday um, thing when we, um, yeah. when we meet again. And just okay. a suggestion on that, if, you know, 10 blasts if you're regular production blasting, that's, that's a pretty hefty number and that's a pretty tall feat to meet that. Um, so, you know, just a suggestion, it, it might be um, worthwhile to put comment in there, you know, reduce the number of production blasts, but when you you can reference micro blasting or cushion blasting and increase the number of blasts allowed in those scenarios. Okay. Could, could you uh, expand on that because I didn't quite follow. So you're saying production blasting is hard to even do 10 a day. Yeah, you know, production blasting is generally you're shooting, you know, 10, 20, 30 holes at a time. Um, so just the amount of physical manpower that goes into being able to do that in machine hours that goes into being able to do that, that'd be a lot of work. Um, so. Personally, you know, I push my blasters to be between four and six 
blasts a day if it's smaller production type shots. Um, when we're doing cushion blasting or micro blasting, um, I try to push them to get as many as they can, obviously because of, you know one more day that you're there is, is thousands of dollars of cost that either we incur or, or the homeowner uh, or owner incurs. But uh, I have to say, I'm sorry to speak out of turn, Madam Chair. No, that's fine. Um, I have to say, I'm very grateful that you are here today and that you came. Yeah. I'm not sure why, um, I'm not sure if Tom, did you notify him that we were meeting or you just Chief saw that we were, Chief, it. thank you Chief Thurlow <laughs> yeah, for doing that because um, I thought I knew what I was talking about. I actually did re some research on this so and talked to some residents so I thought I <laughs> had a good handle on this. I clearly did not. Um, so I, I, I know we're not done yet but I just had to make sure mm -hmm. that you knew I really very much appreciate mm -hmm. you being here. Um, I, I think we've all been educated quite a bit. Um, you know, when I looked, I just was saying to the chair, when I looked at 10, um, 10 explosions a day, for me, that I was like, whoa, <laughs> way too much. That's obnoxious. We cannot ask our residents to tolerate that every day, having to hear that. And then for you to then explain that there are different levels of uh, the explosions, that was that 10 actually may be too low of a number. So I actually understand what you're saying and I think we do need to look at the language and try to maybe put in there, talk about uh, the differences between the blasts and what can be allowed and what can't be allowed. That's what I would ask mm -hmm. um, for my um, fellow council members to think about mm -hmm. also. And just for you know, kind of a point of reference, when you're talking cushion blasting or micro blasting, the noise that could be emitted wouldn't be much more than a gunshot mm -hmm. um, out of a blast of those sizes versus when you're got production blasts, you know, it's about the equivalent. It's actually from an allowable decibel level at the federal level, it's less than what thunder produces. Mm. So when we shoot, um, you know, in large quarry accounts, mm. the allowable uh, decibel level that's allowed to be reached is less than that that a severe thunderstorm produces. And the nuisance level that, so that, uh, <laughs> that neighbors and, and nearby structures feel isn't the ground vibration. That's another misnomer. It's based off the, um, the air blast. Mm -hmm. So the, the wave created through the mm -hmm. air is what actually right. makes you feel like, wow, that was a really violent right. blast. So it, it mm -hmm. yeah, just uh, a little more background. But okay. I don't want to get too far off, off base. Yeah. Did Can you I have any you? other um, things to? So there's that one. And then I'm gonna. And then I had a couple. I looked at the the actual application for blasting. I just had a couple comments on that. I don't have that. Um, okay. Oh yeah, I do. Under the licensed user information, um, it says name of licensed technician for blasting. Uh, once again, we're we're trying to run lean to be cost effective. Uh, sometimes it's not until the day before that we even know who the blaster on site would be. Um, and I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the companies run like that that have more than one or two blasters. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondary to that, there is no license mm -hmm. requirement for a uh, blasting license in the state of Maine for an individual. Um, once again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it, it's more lies on the company to deem certified and qualified individuals, but there's no state mandated license. Um, so then if, if I could. Sure. So then the, if instead of saying license user or name of license technician for blasting, it just said company name, there would still be a license number associated with that company. It's just this, the specificity of exactly the person who's going to be doing it versus the... Correct. Okay. Um, under blasting site information, uh, contact person who knows where the firing point will be. Once again, it's getting specific about you know, um, site logistics and also um, at the time the permit's put in, we might not know who the individual doing the blasting on site will be. Sure. Um, and then continuing down under including, it said five pre-blast meeting with public safety scheduled. I didn't read anything anywhere else in the permit where it mentioned mm -hmm. a uh, pre-blast meeting with the public safety necessary or needed or what constitutes that. So I had some question around that too. Um, jumping down um, under blasting information, it, we have estimated number of blasts. Again, not always knowing the scope. That's near impossible to predict. Same with cubic yards. And then um, to the right of that, transportation with explosive permit received. Uh, 
you know, once again, that's going to be on the truck in the form of a state fire marshal sticker. Um, so that might be tough to get in advance. Okay. But that was the I mean, summation. What was the last one that was going to be hard to get? The transportation of explosives permit received. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? That was <coughs> that was all I had for okay. for comments and notes. Uh, and I I appreciate you coming too because part of um, when I showed up here I'm like geez I'm wondering if anyone from the industry will be here because it's helpful to hear from the industry also so I appreciate you. No, not a problem. And if there's at any time that the the town would like um, you know to have a, a Q and A or, or have um, some time, um, I do that on a regular basis as well. And I I feel that I. It's our duty um, <laughs> to inform people because uh, right. an informed general public is generally a, a lot friendlier general public. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I think we got off track when Will was talking about <coughs> the beginning of Section 5 when he was speaking about the notification in terms of the dates, times, and number of blasts that will occur. Yeah. We kind of jumped down to Section 6 and we're talking about hours of detonation, but didn't right. you have a recommendation for changing? I'm just not sure we came to consensus, right. so I'm not sure what we. Right. Um, <coughs> yeah. I didn't have a. Sorry, I didn't have a uh, specific recommendation, but but uh, generally the way it's it's handled is um, in other towns. Uh, I'll probably be notified. I'm sure you must be notified by phone. Uh, generally, we offer it during the pre. You know, a, a good way to handle it is make it a, a mandate to be offered, um, a a call notification during the the pre-blast process. Mm -hmm. and that way, people can either opt in or opt out. Um, you know, with a one-hour or a 24-hour <coughs> call. Do you do that with the 500-foot butters? That those are the ones you do with that one. Correct, yeah. and the 500-foot the varies. Some towns have it more, some have it less. Right. But kind of the the industry standard is 250 feet. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and like I said, it varies based on um, blasting ordinances per town from right. there. Uh, but being able to call somebody, you know, days in advance and tell them that you know, we're going to perform eight blasts, um, you know, isn't something that's always feasible and once again to, to lock somebody into a permit it says oh, yeah. this is black and white this is the oh, yeah. standard and um, you know hold somebody to that we just we want to make sure that we've created a an easy playing field for you <coughs> folks to enforce and an easy playing field right. for, for industry to live up to so right. and of course our concern from the ordinance point of view are our people our citizens mm -hmm. too when I, I, I'm I'm very happy to hear that your company is very much into we want to make sure that people who are potentially even going to be affected by this blast and you want to do everything you can to educate them and inform them and I think that's, I, well I don't think, I know that's the purpose of having these ordinances too. So that was good to hear that. So. Can I just ask a question before Will goes? Uh, just in your experience, how many towns have a local ordinance in, as opposed to those that simply rely on state or federal regulations? Um, in the state of Maine, because I don't even want to give a statistic, but there's there's probably equal number of towns that have an ordinance that don't have an mm -hmm. ordinance, if not more. Um, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, once you leave kind of Augusta North and Augusta right. East, it's <laughs> right. not, no, there's not a, a lot of <laughs> restrictions there. Uh, a lot of times the way it's handled in the industry is the engineering firms that write the specifications for projects write essentially blasting ordinances into the specifications, um, which obviously wouldn't be picked up on small residential or, um, or small projects where there's no engineer or firm involved. Um, but generally, that's how the towns without blasting ordinances are controlled. You know the. Mm -hmm. The projects are, are mandated by a blasting spec that's put out with the scope of the project. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, of course, towns that have an active quarry in their town yeah, right. where there's co fairly frequent, if not constant, blasting right. in a particular location. And that's generally handled in a separate ordinance or permit. Generally, right. construction they break construction blasting and quarry blasting out right. separately because you're talking two different magnitudes of scale. It's like sure. 
comparing a, a Ford Focus and an 18-wheeler. Uh, <laughs> right. Because you can have, you know, like I said, microblasting, which doesn't take right. place in a quarry application. Right. In quarry application, where it's, you're trying to put as many pounds of explosives in holes as you can huh. while meeting, um, you know, the allowable limits for vibration and air blast. Right. Cool. <coughs> wow. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, so did you have anything else to add? And then I want to ask Mr. Chief. <laughs> So once again, I, I just want to make sure I understand <laughs> where you folks are with that first section in the number hours five. Of uh, in number five, the no. first sentence, yes. um, the intent was certainly to make sure that the citizens and the folks within that notification range get notified. Sure. So uh, to me, the contractor certainly knows the dates that they're going to be blasting and the times. We're not saying we're going to detonate at 1015. It's we're going to be blasting in the morning or the afternoon right. or all day. I have no problem if you wanted to put the approximate number of blasts in there, but I'm not. I just want to make it, get a feel for what you're looking for, if any, in modification of that. Yeah, go ahead. I would say that we should keep it. Um, I'm talking about right here, right? Isn't this what he's asking? So yeah. I would say that we would need to, that we should keep notified either by phone, in person, or in writing of the date. And, and approximate times and along with approximate number okay. of blasts that will occur. Yeah, pretty approximate. I think yeah, we'll I would not. use approximate okay. both in so both of those instances. Just so people understand what the scope may be, because some, sometimes, you know, they just go in and do them one or two. And right. Sometimes they get in there exactly. and there. There's a big difference between, like, what the chair is saying, between one and two and ten or twelve, you know. Um, so I would definitely change that. With the with the expectation that we, you know, obviously we may not know, we don't know at the time. And right. I, I, I mean, yeah. we're not given specific times. We're not saying they're blasting at nine and nine twenty. Right. And as, as for the hours of detonation, where we talked about, um, you know, I still I've asked this, the, um, my fellow council members to consider yeah, we can talk about striking. That. I mean, to putting Saturday in there. So that's something that they're going to have to, um, you know, think about before we can change that. This helps. Would you like to take the? <laughs> um, so, I just. You say your name and. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm not used to. I'm April Hill, and do I need to say my address as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, 14 Maple Avenue. And so, um, <clears throat> I was affected by the recent blasting. I was not notified because, as was discussed, it was, you know, I was like right mm -hmm. on the line. But what happened was, was that, um, first of all, I heard like these loud horns, which, you know, I live right near Route 1, so I thought, like, there was a semi, it was just, like, laying on the horn, you know, I was like, huh, oh, that's kind of weird, and then, um, like, all of a sudden, I had my, my little guinea pig out, and I was sitting on the floor, and all of a sudden, like, my whole house shook, mm -hmm. and we're both, you know, we're like, whoa, what just happened, like, was there, you know, obviously, there was some kind of explosion, and um, so I texted my neighbor, I was like, what happened, did you hear that, and she lives right across the street from me, and she had received notification, oh. so she told me what was going on, but also, um, my neighbor t next door to me also was texting me. She's like, what just happened? What just happened? I'm like, you know, so I told her. But um, so I bring that up because even people who aren't um, affected necessarily, like they won't need a survey, I think that people within maybe, say, even 1,000 feet should be notified because so that we're not calling public safety and jamming up the lines like, hey, you know, what, why is my house shaking or what's going on? Um, but as far as the explosions being milliseconds, they're not milliseconds. It, it was extraordinarily disruptive because you have the blast warning, which is it starts out like at five minutes, and then it's, I don't know, I can't remember, then it's like three minutes, yeah, it's like countdown. And it was like a game. I never like, all right, you know, countdown or whatever, you know, we're like texting each other. But um, it's not the noise either, like the sound of lightning or whatever. It's the vibration. Like all of our houses were, you know, it was like a big shake. And it's very unnerving. Like, if you have any anxiety, my neighbor has little kids, you know, we have pets. It's extremely disruptive. It's not just like a little millisecond thing or like, you know, thunder going off. And so I agree with you. Like, I don't think that it's too stringent to say that you want to put some limitations on how many blasts there are or on what days. But, you know, I, I appreciate the industry perspective that, you know, there's money to be saved, but these are our homes. This is our, you know, this is where we live. And some of us, this is where we work. And so I feel like there has to, the whole reason why I brought this up was so that residents could be, you know, notified and respected that there's something to protect us because the existing federal 
um, ordinances and laws does not deal specifically with notifications and things. Like this, and I found that out when I called the fire marshal's office. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I just wanted to say, like, thank you, and I'm really pleased that we're having this discussion. I think it's really important because I, I, I didn't know anything about, like, blasting, and all of a sudden I was, like, in the middle of it, literally. Mm -hmm. Um, and one other comment was that um, I had put in my notes about the carbon monoxide, which I don't mm -hmm. know too much about, except that when there are explosions, that there is a release of carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see some language in there. Portland has it in there, because for people who live close by, I mean, that's a real danger. Mm -hmm. So that was a concern of mine as well. Mm -hmm. Can I say anything? Be my guest. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just gonna—I just wanted to make follow up on the point that you made about how um, it shakes your house mm -hmm. and it's disruptive. I just know that, like, my nephew is on the spectrum, and um, like, if my sister knew that that was going to happen, something like that of the shaking of the house would actually send him into a tailspin. Mm -hmm. And if she knew that was happening on that day, she would leave for mm -hmm. the day. They would—I mean, they you would probably plan they ahead, would, but you're right. right. They yeah. would leave the area because that would actually be something that would, for a child that has issues like that, it's. It, it can be um, very unnerving for them and for the people that are taking care of them. So I completely can respect what you're saying in that instance. Mm -hmm. Could I, can I ask a question about the yeah. specifics? How many blasts were there on that particular day? I think uh, um, the most, um, I think it was like five, maybe five or six blasts were the and was most. It all on the same day? Yes. Were they all in the same time of day, so to speak? I, like it was all throughout. morning or all? No, it started in the morning and then went through into the afternoon. Gotcha. It's still going on, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's that thing you were discussing earlier. Where yeah. It's like, oh, the um, whole ramming? Yeah, yeah or it sounds like a helicopter. Yeah. You're getting the rant about the yeah. land on my yeah. house. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then I guess I'm, I'm not familiar with the carbon monoxide concern. Could you elaborate on? Yeah, I'm not an expert, but just I noticed in Portland's ordinance, and I put the language in there where it says people who live within 250 feet are to be notified about the dangers or whatever, because when there is um, detonation, and, and you would probably know more about that, that there is a release. Yes, I want to go up there and uh, address this because I've never, yeah, I wasn't mm. there. Uh, certain types of products do emit a, uh, this is Will Purrington again with main drilling, um, certain products do emit um, a byproduct of carbon um, monoxide. Uh, mm -hmm. General industry practice is to have the shot, um, what we call vented, right. so dug um, from the top to the bottom of the borehole to release that gas. Um, if there's fissures or existing utilities, sometimes that gas can escape through those into nearby structures huh. or um, yeah, nearby homes. But uh, that's from uh, IFCE and IME, which IFCE is mm -hmm. International Society of Explosive Engineers, and IME is International uh, Industry uh, Explosive. Excuse me, uh, Explosive Makers um, Industry. Their best practices are to vent every shot, um, and like I said before, right. there are varying degrees of, of contractors in the world, and everybody does things a little bit differently. Sure. Uh, so. Okay. And then, well. what what is the um, language in the in the Portland ordinance? Or, I mean, roughly, is it just to I notify? It, I don't have it in front of it. Um, it should be in the copy that you have, but it just says like to notify them. And I remember, like, then they have to put in a carbon monoxide detector. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we, we did review that comment on reference to carbon monoxide, and, and we did speak to a couple other companies, and they said pretty much the same thing Will said. Um, but a lot of times, um, one of the other companies, I think LP Murray uh, I talked to, said that Portland, when they were developing their ordinance, um, one of the big concerns was more based upon the industry standard of monitoring for their employees that are working oh, on that yeah. site. So if they're going in um, and doing their work, that they're monitoring it for their safety. And I don't want to misspeak, so if I, if I am, please let me know. But um, the other industry people we talked to said that you know, they felt there, like there wasn't much of a concern um, to, to monitor it you know, in rural Scarborough. Like in downtown mm -hmm. Portland, it might make sense because of the right. city, some of the buildings and you know, how close they might be, I think, where he was talking as well. But in, in Scarborough, we really don't have a real robust downtown anywhere right. um, that they didn't really see it being a, a large concern. Um, right. So we, we kind of heard that and figured we'd get some input today and see where we wanted to go with it. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, for the blast, um, 
last thing was going off, it is very tight knit. I mean, it's like right on Route 1, so there were businesses right there and homes, so that's why I thought, you know, it would be important to put something. Because I, I recognize that Scarborough's could be very rural, but also it could be very tight knit. Um, I did have one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do we have any, any kind of signs put up in advance, or um, yeah, did people, did neighbors? So you, I had, most of us had no idea. Gotcha. And is that anything? Is that ever typically? Is that ever done to say that you got to put up signs in advance? Well, in the 500 foot radius, they are. But I, th I think the point was raised about what about the people thing. that are 600 yeah, feet away or a thousand feet away. Like we have. Yeah. This is uh, <laughs> well, Burlington again. Uh, there's supposed to be blasting right. zone or blasting area signs out on the outskirts of the construction oh. area, notifying that there is blasting activities going on. Um, so once again, that's a case by case contractor standpoint if they're doing the ethical and responsible thing or they're just going about it, you know, willy-nilly, so. Okay. And that's, but that's at the time of the blasting, that's not in advance. No. Of the that's during the blasting activities while they're happening on site, correct? Yeah, I see most of them. Well, Actually, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, if I ahead. may add to that, um, that's one thing I learned because I started Googling things and doing some research is that um, my understanding is that there should have been signs, like even on Maple Avenue, it's a certain mm -hmm. number of feet within the blasting area, not just at this sure. blasting site thing. But, and I didn't see those signs. And so that was something else I wanted to mention. Mm -hmm. There weren't signs. I actually went down. Not there. on Maple Avenue. And oh. not, no. And, and it was within a certain number of feet. Sure. Anything else? That you um, no, just again, thank you. All right. For yeah. No, thank you for thank bringing you. it to our yeah. attention. All right. What is the pleasure of? Can I just yeah, ask a question control. to the chief? Um, do you have any sense of, you know, there's been a fair amount of act building activity in Scarborough through the years. Yes, we're large and somewhat rural, but what's the nature of the history of complaints? Can you speak to that at all? Great question. Honestly, very few. I mean, every once in a while we'll get a complaint uh, or more of a question than a complaint, what's going on. But I'll be honest with you, Tom, in my 10 plus years here as chief, uh, I bet I haven't taken four or five complaints. Mm -hmm. Last yeah, there's a fair amount that, yeah. that takes place. We haven't been permitting it, so I can't quantify that, but right. there's routinely blasting going on in town. There's a, a lot of rock and, and yeah. scatter, a lot of residential blasting for sure. There's not been a ton of huge commercial, commercial projects, oh. but they, they certainly happen on a routine mm -hmm. basis. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, cool. Please. For this, would you like to make a motion for this? So I'd like to um, make a motion that we um, table item number four um, to allow for the fire department to update and make some of the changes that were discussed during this meeting and maybe be, maybe, maybe be um, in a month when we meet again, mm -hmm. we could have that brought back to us if they think that's sufficient time um, for us to review it again. Mm -hmm. I have a second? Mm -hmm. oh, we have a can I get a second? And then he can yeah, we need second. a second. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. No, All right, go ahead. Month is fine to, to come back with some revisions. I guess, are you going to take a policy position on what you want to do in terms of the times and dates so that we can incorporate those? Or how did you want to? Um, I know I feel like I need to digest yeah. a lot of what I've heard today. Okay. So, but if you so we'll, could We'll incorporate further, what we've heard. Yes. I was going to give them the money. And then you can further. Yes. Yeah, and then we'll further refine it, with, which would be. I've that's told, my preference. I've told them okay where, how I, I feel that. about I'm it and what it should be, that. and then I've asked them to, to consider adding Saturday in on that line, and then hopefully within the month when we come back, we'll be able to. Um, that's a quick change that we can make, and we can incorporate. So if everything yes. else is good, and it, everything we agree on everything mm -hmm. and we can make that quick amendment and then we can still send it to the council that meeting if that's the only change that we have to make if, um, the, ch if the chair <laughs> agrees with that <laughs> obviously what the chair would like to mention is our next meeting is scheduled for when the chair is away well then we should probably change the meeting so that's what i'm warning or we can push it off till august for that meeting in august it's up to you you decide what you want to do You want to uh, give them uh, till August? 
I would just some push off till August just because of could I vacations and yeah. that and the other thing. Could I ask that potentially that you two maybe then if we're gonna push it off till August that maybe by the end of July if you guys had come to a decision on the Saturday thing, we might be able to send that in an email to them. I don't think we need yeah. an actual formal motion for that. Yeah. Tracy, would you mind looking at a calendar? I, is that August meeting would be August 16th? Is that 16th. correct? Is what I, I just want to remember. double check that so yeah, everyone August knows. August 16th Why don't we, uh, I'm going to make a motion. <laughs> that we move our ordinance, our next ordinance committee will be uh, Tuesday, August 16th at 4 o'clock here in the chambers. Is that I'll all right with that. me? Sure. All agreed with that? <laughs> we have a second? I yeah, we'll, we'll second it. We'll. <laughs> and then I'd like to make a motion to um, adjourn. I'll second that as well. All in favor? Okay. Thank that. you, everybody. That was very, that was, Interesting. I have a monkey at daycare. <laughs> I know, you have to do that. Yeah, her mother. So is a daycare. <laughs> <laughs> they don't care that I'm trying to make it.